Welcome back everybody. This is Mr. Johnson with you once again. Uh, this is lecture 18, part 1. What our book refers to as Relationships and Patterns in Chemistry. We're in chapter 6 now. Uh, or what I'll be referring to as periodic trends. That's a common term for this concept is periodic trends. Um, and thanks for making this channel one of the hottest on YouTube. We are trending all over the world. It's amazing to see. What we're going to be talking about today is a little bit more about the layout of the periodic table and what it tells us about some of the patterns that exist around um, the atoms here in nature. And then we're going to be talking about three different periodic trends over the course of Lecture 18 Part 1 and Lecture 18 Part 2. There's three periodic trends that you need to be familiar and comfortable with. One of those is atomic radius or atomic size. So we're going to be talking about the trends that exist as you move across and down the periodic table for atomic radius or atomic size. We're also going to be talking about ionization energy and the trends that exist in the periodic table as we move across and down the periodic table in ionization energy. And then the third trend is electronegativity, which describes a whole lot about why atoms bond the way they do. So atomic radius or atomic size, ionization energy, and electronegativity will be the three periodic trends we'll be talking about in these two lectures. So I've turned to page 309 of our textbook, or 317 of our ebook, and here's a beautiful periodic table uh, labeled with all sorts of important information. First thing I'd like to be clear with you about is that columns are called groups on the periodic table, and they're also commonly called families. Columns are most commonly referred to as groups, and are some to referred, excuse me, sometimes referred to as well as families. And as you can see, there's 18 groups in the periodic table. The rows of the periodic table are called periods. The rows of the periodic table are called periods, and there are seven rows or seven periods in the periodic table. The S block and the P block, which we'll look at again in a moment, are referred to collectively as the representative elements. So groups 1, 2, and then 13 through 18 are the representative elements. The D block are referred to as the transition elements. And the F block are referred to as the inner transition elements. And the two rows of the F block, F block are called the lanthanides and actinides. Less important to remember. This zigzaggy line, if you didn't know before, is what delineates the metals, which are on the lower left side of the periodic table. The majority of elements on Earth are metals from the nonmetals, which lie to the upper right of that zigzaggy line. And there are fewer, as you can see, nonmetals than metals. The elements that border this zigzaggy line that exhibit properties of metals and nonmetals, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, are called the metalloids or the semi-metals. So boron and silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, and polonium are the metalloids or the semi-metals. Again, everything to the left of this zigzaggy line are our metals, and to the upper right are our nonmetals. I've turned the page, I'm now on 310 of the textbook, and this is talking about some of the properties of metals, nonmetals, and metalloids or semi-metals. Rather than reading these to you, I suggest that you read them to yourself. The properties of the metals include all of these, and we'll be talking about them more as the year progresses. The properties of the nonmetals include these. Again, I recommend that you read these. And then semi-metals or metalloids, which exhibit metal and nonmetal-like properties, are described down here. So take a peek at that. We're now going to talk briefly about valence electrons. And valence electrons are extremely important to us in this class and in chemistry because it is the number of valence electrons and the energy level that they are in that dictates largely how an atom behaves. The properties of an atom are based largely on the number of its electrons and how many valence electrons an atom has and in what energy level they are. The valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost principal energy level. Again, valence electrons are electrons in the outermost principal energy level, not necessarily the last sublevel to fill or the outermost sublevel. So I'm going to take you to the whiteboard to look at a Bohr model and a quantum model to make sure we're clear about what valence electrons are and are not. So we use bromine as an example, element 35. And um, bromine is in the P block, it's in the 4P block. If we were to write its electron configuration, it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, and then 4p5 would be its final term. And we see it down there. If we want to evaluate how many valence electrons bromine has, we again want to go back to the definition as the number of electrons in the outermost principal energy level. 
Remember, it's this large number in front of each of these terms that is the principal energy level, the one, the two, and the three. And notice that the highest principal energy level is the fourth. Yes, the 3D fills after the 4S, but the 4S and 4P are in the highest principal energy level. And the number of valence electrons in bromine, therefore, is 7, because there are 7 total electrons in the highest principal energy level. The D electrons are not valence electrons. They're in a lower principal energy level. In fact, D electrons will never be valence electrons, because any time we fill a D sublevel, we have always filled an S sublevel of a higher principal energy level first. And then if you make it all the way through the D block, you fill the P sublevel of that same energy level that was the S. That is true of the F sublevel electrons as well. They will never be valence electrons because they are always two energy levels behind the higher up S and P. What that means is that S and P electrons will only ever be valence electrons. They will only ever be in the highest principal energy level because of the way that the Ds and Fs fill. What this means then is that if we count the columns from left to right of the S and P block, the order in which we count them is the number of valence electrons that each of those elements in that column or group has. Every element in this column has one valence electron. Its last term is S1. Every element in this column has two valence electrons. Its last term will be S2. We jump the D block, we go to the P block, Every one of these elements in this column will have three valence electrons because their two highest energy level terms will be S2, P1. These will have four, S2, P2, five, S2, P3, six, seven, and eight. Again, D and F electrons will never be valence electrons because they're always in a lower energy level than the highest. As you may or may not recollect, atoms form bonds and or form ions in order to be more stable. And stability is achieved through a full outer energy level. Stability is achieved through what's called a full octet, or having an electron configuration of a noble gas, which has that full octet or that full outer energy level. If we look at the electron configurations, once again, of all the elements in group one, we know they have one valence electron. If they were to lose that one valence electron, They'd lose that outer energy level. The energy level underneath would then be the outermost. It would be full, and those atoms would be stable. And this is why all the group one elements, or the alkali metals, when they form ions, form one plus ions, because in so doing, they have noble gas configuration or a full octet. The group two elements, called the alkaline earths, in the second column with two valence electrons, become stable by losing those two, having a full octet again. And then if we look at the halogens in group 7, for example, with 7 valence electrons, they are inclined to gain one valence electron, and in so doing, to get a full octet or the electron configuration of noble gases as well. So the placement of the elements in the periodic table allows us to know how many valence electrons they have and how many they're likely to gain or lose in order to achieve a full valence shell. The rule of thumb is that an atom wants to achieve the electron configuration of the nearest noble gas. Metals lose valence electrons to go to the noble gas above them in the periodic table. Nonmetals gain valence electrons to achieve the electron configuration of the noble gas in their row or period. I flipped the page. I'm now in 320 of the ebook or 312 of the textbook, I'm looking at this section called transition elements, which we'll talk more about later. But we won't focus too much in this class on the transition elements. Uh, they're pretty complex to understand. It's outside the scope somewhat of this class. One thing though I want you to know is that as you move across the transition elements, across the D block, the trends and the patterns that we see when we move across those other elements is not as striking, is not as noteworthy. And the biggest reason for that is as you move across a D block and are gaining electrons, the electrons that are gained are not valence electrons. D electrons are never valence electrons. And the fact that as we move back and forth across the D block and that those don't mean gaining and losing valence electrons makes those patterns moving across the D block a little bit different. And we'll talk more about that later. I flipped one more page to 313, and this is a really nice depiction in our book of the periodic table being blocked out into the S block, D block, P block, and F block. So hopefully this looks familiar to you and is a nice resource if you ever need to come back to it.
And I flip the page one more time to 314 of the textbook, and this is a nice depiction of what the periodic table would look like had chemists not decided to shrink it into a narrower periodic table. This is showing the inner transition elements, the lanthanides and actinides, where they actually exist, which is after the S block and before the D block, down here in the sixth and seventh periods of the periodic table. Substantiating why after six S fills, four F fills, and then five D fills, and as well why after seven S fills, five S fills, and then six D. We have now moved on from section 6.1, we're on section 6.2, and this is on page 317 of our textbook, or 325 of our ebook. I invite you to take a moment and do this warm-up here at the top of this page. Do this warm-up on your own, pause the video, and come back when you're done and compare your answers to mine. All right, question one asked, what attractive force is responsible for holding the cloud of electrons in place in atoms? Electrons, of course, are negatively charged. It is the positively charged protons in the nucleus that create that attractive force between the electrons and the nucleus, the protons in the nucleus. And that's a huge factor. That attractive force and the number of protons in the nucleus is a huge factor in what it is that influences how atoms behave and these periodic trends. What effect would a strength in that force have on the size of atoms? Well, if there was a stronger attractive force, more protons, let's say, in the nucleus, pulling the electrons in with a greater force, the atom would become a bit smaller. The atoms would get smaller if all other factors remained the same if you added more positive charge to the nucleus. What might cause a strengthening of that force? Well, I mentioned that already. More protons. But if the distance between the nucleus and the electrons decreases, we'll find, if you didn't know that already, that that also strengthens the attractive force. Not only does the number of protons affect the attractive force, but how far away from the nucleus the electrons are, or the distance between the nucleus and the electrons affects the force as well. What might contribute to a weakening of that force? Fewer protons, or as well a greater distance between the nucleus and the electrons would weaken that attractive force. I'm on that same page. I just scrolled down, and we're in this section called periodic trends. Here we finally are, periodic trends. The statement highlighted in pink says that as we move across, across for us is from left to right, or down, down a column, down a family, down a group, there are regular changes in elemental properties. When we refer to these periodic trends, we tend to refer to them going across from left to right, the periodic table, or down. We could just as well refer to the trends as we go from right to left or go up. The trends will be opposite, but it is convention and common, once again, to refer to trends as moving across left to right or down the periodic table. As I mentioned in our intro, there's three periodic trends we will be talking about over these two lectures. Atomic size or atomic radius, ionization energy, and electronegativity. This is the first one, atomic size or atomic radius. Um, it's, it's actually very difficult to get an accurate measurement of the size of an atom, in part because atoms are often moving or vibrating and as well the electron clouds are difficult to visualize. The electrons are moving around in these orbits, they're moving extremely fast, and it's difficult to visualize how far away they ever get from the atom, given that they can be in a lot of different places. So how the size of an atom is measured, which gives us a reasonably accurate representation of its size, is by looking at two like atoms bonded together. If two sodium atoms, atoms were bonded together, sodium is a metal, by the way, so this would be a metallic bond, um, they, these atoms, end up Quite, quite next to each other, adjacent to each other. Maybe they overlap a little bit, but they're close enough together to imagine being adjacent. Well, the nuclei of atoms are able to be visualized. You can visualize the nucleus of these two atoms with a very sophisticated device. And if you measure the distance between the, two, the nuclei of two like bonded atoms and divide that distance in half, that becomes the radius of the atom. So again, if you measure the distance between the nuclei of two like bonded atoms and divide that in half, that becomes a fairly accurate measurement of the atomic radius or the atomic size. For nonmetals, the same thing can happen. Although when nonmetals bond, they do tend to overlap in their electron clouds a little bit. So when you measure the distance between the nuclei of two like bonded nonmetal atoms and divide it in half to get the radius, the radius you get is typically a little bit shorter than the actual radius. 
which means that the atomic radii that we see published in tables isn't always a perfectly accurate indication of the true size of the atoms, but it's as good as we can get. So we've turned the page. We're on 318 of our textbook or 326 of our ebook, looking at the section titled Factors Influencing Atomic and Ionic Size. There will always be two factors that we use to explain any of these periodic trends, whether it's atomic radius, ionization energy, or electronegativity. There's two factors we need to again look at. One of those factors is how many energy levels the atom has. How big the atom is, how many energy levels it has. The other factor we will look at is what's called the effective nuclear charge. What the attractive force is from the nucleus that is being exerted on the electrons. The effective nuclear charge. And I'm about to explain that to you. But what effective nuclear charge is not is the actual number of protons. Rather, it's the number of protons that are felt by the outermost electrons. And I'll explain that to you in a moment. But hang on to the notion that when we want to evaluate any of these periodic trends, we want to look at how many energy levels there are and what the effective nuclear charge is. All right, here we go. Hugely important concept, effective nuclear charge. Explains a lot about how atoms behave the way they do. Up here is the formula for how to find the effective nuclear charge. Except in a moment, I'm going to show you a shortcut. And this is on page 334 of our textbook, although it's not super well explained there in my opinion. The effective nuclear charge is found by taking the number of protons in the nucleus and subtracting from that number the number of shielding electrons. Again, it's the number of protons minus the number of shielding electrons. Well, what are shielding electrons? Shielding electrons are all of the electrons that are not valence electrons. In aluminum's case, and I've drawn a Bohr model here for aluminum, there's two electrons in the first energy level, eight in the second, I've chosen not to differentiate the 2s and 2p electrons. I'm just looking at principal energy levels. And then there's 3 in the third. The first two energy levels are the non-valence electrons. These are referred to as the shielding electrons. Those electrons are negatively charged. And what they do is shield the attractive force from the nucleus. They shield the attractive force of the nucleus on these valence electrons, because it's all about valence electrons and how attracted the valence electrons are to the nucleus. Because the shielding electrons are all negatively charged, what they're doing is exerting a repulsive force on the valence electrons. They are pushing them out. And the idea, and it's not perfect mathematically, is that each shielding electron, in this case there are 10 of them, each shielding electron exerts about the same repulsive force outward on the valence electrons as each proton in the nucleus would exert an inward or an attractive force on those valence electrons. So what we're saying here is that 10 electrons worth of charge from these shielding electrons cancels out 10 protons worth of attractive force. So if we take 13 protons in the nucleus and subtract from that the 10 non-valence or shielding electrons, we get three. We get an effective nuclear charge of three. Despite that aluminum has 13 protons, there's really only three protons worth or three positive charges worth of attractive force being exerted on those valence electrons. Now, notice that three is the same as the number of valence electrons. Hang on to that pattern for a moment. If we look at sulfur with 16 protons, and sulfur, by the way, is in the same row as is aluminum. They both have three energy levels worth of electrons. We now know that these are the shielding electrons, those that aren't valence electrons. And if we subtract from 16, the number of protons, the number of shielding electrons, we get 6. The effective nuclear charge for an atom of sulfur is 6, which is not coincidentally, once again, the number of valence electrons. So instead of doing this every time, you can know that the effective nuclear charge for elements that aren't transition elements is the number of valence electrons, or is the column number that they are in. Again, that doesn't work for the transition elements, which we'll talk about the reason for in a bit. So if we look at the third row of the periodic table, for example, which I've boxed in red, as we go across this third row, or frankly, as you go across any row, because the number of valence electrons is increasing, 
or because the number of protons is increasing but the number of shielding electrons isn't increasing, the effective nuclear charge goes up. The effective nuclear charge of all the elements in the first column is 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6, then 7, then 8. Hang on to that idea. It's going to explain a lot. As you go across a row, excluding the D block, the effective nuclear charge increases because there's an increase in the number of protons and there's no change in the number of shielding electrons, only a change in the number of valence electrons. So now we're going to look at what happens as you go down a group from magnesium to calcium, let's say, or magnesium to strontium. As you go down a group, what happens to effective nuclear charge then? You might know already, if we've already substantiated that the column number, or the number of valence electrons, is the effective nuclear charge, that should mean then that as you go down a column, the effective nuclear charge does not change. And that is true. Just want to take you to a couple Bohr models real quick to prove that. So here we see magnesium with 12 protons and 10 shielding electrons, two in the first, eight in the second, two in the valence shell. 12 minus 10 is two. Calcium, though, has 20 protons, but it has four energy levels worth of electrons, two in the first, eight in the second, eight in the third, and two in the fourth. And in calcium's case, 20 minus 18 is two once again. So this is proof, one could argue, due to the math that as we go up or down columns, despite that substantial protons are being gained, they're being canceled out by the same gain of shielding electrons. Really important to know, as you move up and down a column, up and down a group, the effective nuclear charge doesn't change, or the attractive force that the nucleus is exerting on the outermost electrons effectively doesn't change. All right, we're almost ready to go back to the trend in atomic size, but I need to talk with you first about Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law, hugely important law in science that describes the force of attraction between charged particles. Again, this is the law, the equation that describes the force of attraction between charged particles. The F is for the force, the K is for a constant, and we're just going to ignore that constant right now. It varies based on the situation. Q1 represents the charge on the first object or the first particle. Charges are measured in coulombs. That's why it's called Coulomb's law. We'll figure out what a coulomb is later. Q1, again, is the charge on the first object. Q2 is the charge on the second object. And if those charges are opposite, the force is attractive. Ends up being negative. Attractive forces are negative. And if those charges are the same, it'll be a repulsive force, a positive force. And then R squared is the radius, or the distance between the two objects. This represents the distance between the two objects. That should have really been a D squared. It's fine. All right, so what we want to use Coulomb's law to describe is the attractive force that exists between the nucleus and one valence electron at a time. Because everything about atoms and the way they behave is how attracted the nucleus is to one valence electron at a time. We could look at them collectively, but we tend to focus on them one at a time. Well, if we're talking about one electron and its charge is fixed, we could consider that a constant as well. So we could get rid of, let's say, Q1 from this. All right, it's, a, it's a fixed factor. And all we use Coulomb's law for is, is to talk about relative forces, how strong one force is to another. So it's okay to get rid of these constants because we don't need actual values. So we're left with Q2 over R squared. What Q2 is, is the charge from the nucleus. But it's not the number of protons. It's the effective nuclear charge. It's how many protons worth of charge the outermost electrons actually feel. So we're going to rewrite this to say the force of attraction between a nucleus's, excuse me, an atom's nucleus and a valence electron is equal to the effective nuclear charge. I could have written ZEFF over the distance squared between the nucleus and the outermost electrons. To simplify that, we can just say it's the number of energy levels. Because again, it doesn't need to be mathematical, it just needs to be relative. So I'm going to turn the denominator from the distance squared into something analogous to it, which is the number of energy levels. Which takes us back to what I began this conversation, or at least this part of this conversation with, which is that there's two factors that influence the periodic trends, which are based on the force of attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons. It's the number of energy levels and the effect of nuclear charge. And that's coming from a simplification of Coulomb's law. Again, the force of attraction between the nucleus and one valence electron at a time 
is directly related to the effect of nuclear charge, more effective nuclear charge, greater force of attraction, and indirectly or inversely related to the number of energy levels. If there's more energy levels, if the distance is greater, that force goes down. Hang on to that. All right, finally, back to this section about factors influencing atomic and ionic size, which again is page, uh-oh, I lost it, um, 318. So the first factor is the number of energy levels present, as we heard a moment ago. As the number of energy levels increases, the atoms just plain get bigger. You could imagine, right? As we get further and further away from the nucleus with more energy levels, they get bigger. Another way to explain that, though, is with more energy levels, there's a weaker force of attraction, and therefore the electrons spend more time on average away from the nucleus. With more energy levels, atoms get bigger. And that is shown in this diagram here, showing atoms' relative sizes to each other in the periodic table. As we go down a group, when the number of energy levels increases, but the effective nuclear charge doesn't change, atoms get bigger. Again, as you go down a group, as the number of energy levels increases, but the effective nuclear charge doesn't change, atoms get bigger. And that trend is seen down every single group in the periodic table. The other factor that influences the size of atoms is effective nuclear charge, which come in, comes into play as you go across a row, across a period. As you go across a row or a period, the number of energy levels doesn't change. The denominator of that force of attraction, Coulomb's law simplification doesn't change, but the effective nuclear charge increases. As you go across a period, the effective nuclear charges, charge increases. That creates a stronger attractive force on those electrons, the valence electrons, and that pulls them in closer. And I'll just read this statement to you. As the amount of nuclear charge felt or seen by the outer electrons increases, they're pulled closer to the nucleus, and the atom gets smaller. So here are trends for atomic radius. Once again, as you go down a group, atoms get bigger due to increase in energy levels and no change in effective nuclear charge. As you go across a row, atoms get smaller due to no change in energy levels, but due to an increase in effective nuclear charge or an attractive pull from the nucleus on the electrons, bring them in closer. And that is summarized right down here in these beautiful blue and pink statements. Almost done with this first part of this lecture. Remember, though, that we talked about the transition elements. As you move across the transition elements, the patterns that we see elsewhere not often arising. And that's true for atomic radius. As you look at the size of the atoms as we go across this D block here, it doesn't seem to change much. It does through the S, it does through the P, but it doesn't through the D. And that tends to repeat itself in the 4D and 5D as well. The reason why is because as you move through the D block or the transition elements and protons are being gained, which could lead you to believe that the effective nuclear charge goes up, the electrons that are gained are shielding electrons. As you move through the D block and you gain protons, you're also gaining shielding electrons, and that means that the effective nuclear charge as you move across actually isn't increasing. I'm going to take you back to the whiteboard one last time to give you evidence of that. So we're going to compare vanadium to iron, vanadium to iron here, element 23 to element 26, elements that are in the D block, but in the same row. And we should see that the effective nuclear charge for vanadium and iron is the same, which is why they're roughly the same size. So here we see vanadium and iron with 23 protons, 26 electrons, respectively, and their electron configurations. The difference being that iron has three additional 3D electrons. Its last term is 3D6, whereas vanadium's is 3D3. Those extra electrons are depicted here via these red circles. Iron only has 11 electrons in the third energy level, whereas, excuse me, vanadium only has 11, whereas iron has 14. Because those additional electrons are not in the outermost energy level, are shielding electrons, when we look at the effective nuclear charge for vanadium and iron, we see that they are both equal to 2. Elements in the D block all have an effective nuclear charge of 2. And elements in the D block all have two valence electrons, which equals their effective nuclear charge. And that is because all transition metals will always have an S2 that is in the highest principal energy level. The S 
two electrons or the valence electrons for all transition elements. All right, lecture 18, part one has now come to a close. Thanks for being an active participant in today's lecture. I look forward to seeing you in 18, part two. Take care, everybody.